Well, hello, my name is Paul Douglas, and I'd like to welcome you to episode number four of Critical Thinking for Mormons. The faulty analogy is where an analogy is used to prove or disprove an argument, but the analogy itself is too dissimilar to be effective. That is, it's too much unlike the argument than it's like the argument. The logical form is A is P, B is P, A is Q, therefore B is Q. An analogy is established between two things, A and B. Both have the characteristic P. A has the characteristic Q, hence it's inferred that B also has that same characteristic Q. Here's an example. Not believing in the literal resurrection of Jesus because the Bible has errors and contradictions is like denying that the Titanic sank because eyewitnesses did not agree if the ship broke in half before or after it sank. This is an actual analogy used by a Christian debater who usually appears to value reason and logic a bit more. There are several problems, of course, with this analogy. First of all, the Titanic sank in recent history. Secondly, we know for a fact that the testimonies we have are from actual eyewitnesses. And thirdly, we have physical evidence of the sunken Titanic. Me and the boys wish to thank you for hanging on to this stuff for us. Thanks. Uh, say, are you guys crooks? But, um, is it wrong to steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? No. Well, suppose you got a large starving family. Is it wrong to steal a truckload of bread to feed them? Uh uh And what if your family don't like bread? They like cigarettes. I guess that's okay. Now, what if instead of giving them away, you sold them at a price that was practically giving them away? Would that be a crime, Bart? Hell no. Enjoy your gift. <laughs> A few more examples. Smoking cigarettes is just like ingesting arsenic into your system. Both have been shown to be causally related to death. Or making people register their guns is like the Nazis making the Jews register with the government. Or children are like dogs. They need to be strongly disciplined and housebroken. Or people who have to have a cup of coffee every morning before they can function are no different than alcoholics who have to have their booze each day to sustain them. Or Joseph Smith's martyrdom was just like Jesus Christ's crucifixion. 250 people a year die from poverty. And the poverty line is getting such that more and more people are gonna fall below that because the economy is crashing around us. And they're doing that because people are dying from the coronavirus. I get that. But look, the fact of the matter is we have people dying, 45,000 people a year die from automobile accidents, 480,000 from cigarettes, 360,000 a year from swimming pools, but we don't shut the country down for that. But yet we're doing it for this, and the fallout is going to last for years because people's lives are being destroyed. Ah, oh, yes, D. Todd Christofferson, who said adultery, promiscuity, elective abortion, and out-of-wedlock births are but some of the bitter fruits that grow out of the immorality sanctioned by the sexual revolution. He probably didn't recognize it, but Christofferson was stigmatizing the children of unmarried parents, in effect borrowing from the standard term for such offspring, bastards. In the past, such children were routinely marginalized, humiliated, and mistreated for something done by their parents over which they had no control and for which, therefore, they should not be blamed. Here's a partial list of some fairly accomplished people who were born out of wedlock. Leonardo da Vinci, Confucius, Ptolemy, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Paine, Eva Perone, Steve Jobs, Oprah Winfrey, T.S. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, Fidel Castro, Marilyn Monroe, and Cicero. Remember the object lesson of the lick cupcake? An LDS youth leader would bring to church enough cupcakes so that everyone in class could have just one. Then the first person was asked to take a cupcake, but licked the icing off a second one and put it back in the tray, and then passed the cupcakes around so that everybody else could take one. Of course, the last person in class was stuck with the lick cupcake. And of course, they wouldn't eat it. The lick cupcakes is the chastity lesson, always representing females. In young women's, the girls were taught that no one wants a cupcake already licked by someone else. So don't let boys lick your cupcake or no one will want you. J. Reuben Clark, first counselor in the first presidency, in the April 1943 General Conference said, we stand for a single standard for chastity. For boys and for girls, we look upon unchastity as a sin next to murder. Marquis e. Peterson, apostle, said in October of 1968, 
To understand the true dignity of man, we must accept the highest state of women. Every girl and woman is a daughter of God. She has within her the spark of divinity. She has been given one of God's greatest creative powers, the ability to bring forth human life. Recognizing her as a co-creator with God, will any of us attempt to seduce her, to defile her, to abuse her? Identifying her as a daughter of God and a co-creator of life with him, do we not see why the Almighty places sex in next to murder in the category of crime? As most of us know, Mormonism teaches that consensual sexual sin, especially adultery, but also fornication, premarital sex, and masturbation, is the sin next to murder. This is based primarily on Alma 39.5, which states, Know ye not, my son, that these things are an abomination in the sight of the Lord, yea, most abominable, above all sin, say it be the shedding of innocent blood, or denying the Holy Ghost. Are there not more serious crimes than sexual sins? How about child sex abuse, or the torture of another human being? How about rape? How about a Mormon bishop telling a 10-year-old girl that they're immoral, or causing a confused teen to feel so worthless that they commit suicide? Spencer W. Kimball said, Your sin is the most serious thing you could have done in your youth, this side of murder. Joseph F. Smith said, Whoever sheddeth innocent blood, by man shall his blood be shed, thereby God has given the law. Life is an important thing. No one has the right to take life unless God commanded it. The law of God as to the violation of the marriage covenant is just as strict and is on a parallel with the law against murder, notwithstanding the former is not carried out. Harold B. Lee said, Satan is trying to inflame those people to engage in sexual relations outside of holy wedlock. The sin which the Lord has said is next to murder in seriousness. And Ezra Taft Benson said, immorality is next to murder in God's category of crime and always brings with it attendant remorse. A person cannot indulge in promiscuous relations without suffering ill effects from it. He cannot be wrong and feel right. It's impossible. I think he also said, if the person that you're having sex with is a communist, it's worse than murder. No, I think I made that up. The mistake. An argument from analogy tries to establish something about an unknown or contested case from something about a known or uncontested case. The rationale is that if you can establish that a certain thing holds for the uncontested case, you can infer that something similar holds or is similar to the contested case. The comeback, of course, is that since your opponent's argument rests on the apparent similarity of the cases, you need to show that the cases are, in fact, dissimilar. The slippery slope. The fault is that when a fairly minor event is suggested to lead to a more significant event, which in turn leads to an even more significant event, which will, in turn, lead to an even more significant event, etc., until an extreme event is reached and where the connection of the of each event is not only unwarranted, but with each step becomes less and less probable. An example is if we allow gays to marry, the next thing you know, people will want to marry farm animals or even inanimate objects. Who knows where it'll end? The logical form is if A, then B, then C, etc., until Z. When your cable company keeps you on hold, you get angry. When you get angry, you go blow off steam. When you go blow off steam, accidents happen. When accidents happen, you get an eye patch. When you get an eye patch, people think you're tough. When people think you're tough, people want to see how tough. And when people want to see how tough, you wake up in a roadside ditch. Don't wake up in a roadside ditch. Get rid of cable and upgrade to Direct TV. Call 1 800 Direct TV. Every form of homosexuality is sin. Pornography is one of the approaches to that transgression. There is no half way. Some people are ignorant or vicious and apparently attempting to destroy the concept of masculinity and femininity. More and more girls dress, groom, and act like men. More and more men dress, groom, and act like women. The high purposes of life are damaged and destroyed by the growing unisex. God made man in his own image, male and female made he them. With relatively few accidents of nature, we are born 
male and female. The Lord knew best, certainly men and women who would change their sex status will answer to their maker. Thomas S. Munson said, if you let gays marry, what's next? A bisexual marrying a man and a woman? A man marrying a hedgehog? With his deceptions and lies, the adversary will lead you down a slippery slope to your destruction if you allow him to do so. You will likely be on the slippery slope before you even realize that there's no way to stop. You've heard the messages of the adversary. He cunningly calls, just this one won't matter. Everyone is doing it. Don't be old-fashioned. Times are changing. It can't hurt anybody. Your life is yours to live. The adversary knows us, and he knows the temptations, which will be difficult for us to ignore. How vital it is that we exercise constant vigilance in order to avoid giving in to such lies and temptations. Great courage will be required as we remain faithful and true amid the ever-increasing pressures and insidious influences with which we're surrounded and which distort the truth, tear down the good, and attempt to substitute man-made philosophies of men. Nothing seems to have drawn the unwavering interest of the brethren, however, than the evil scourge of masturbation. It's interesting, however, that prior to the 1950s, there was virtually no church literature, let alone official prophetic or revelatory church statements, specifically mentioning its practice. Yes, there were some discussions among the brethren on the subject in the late 19th century. Minutes from the private 1870 School of the Prophets leadership meetings, limited only to the top Mormon officials, show that the apostle Lorenzo Snow shared his opinion that plural marriage would tend to diminish this evil self-pollution. The following year, again in the minutes recorded, Apostle David Wells stated, a great many of our young men are abusing themselves by the habit of self-pollution. He shared with those in attendance that this was one great cause of why so many of our young men are not married, and it's a great sin and would lead to insanity and a premature grave. Joseph Smith himself chose not to speak on the subject. However, he did say, I frequently fell into many foolish errors and displayed the weaknesses of youth and the foibles of human nature, which, I'm sorry to say, led me in diverse temptations, offensive in the sight of God. This admission, as well as his very healthy libido, was likely, at least in part, what this adolescent farm boy was referring to. Strangely, after a century of relative silence, it wasn't until the mid-20th century, when modern science had conclusively demonstrated that masturbation was harmless and had come to consider it, if anything, an important component of healthy sexual development, that the Mormon leadership turned their focus to it. The church's attitude towards masturbation have since had its own unique evolution, not only reverting to the disproven 19th century views on the health dangers of masturbation, but also by establishing it as a grievous sin. When Dr. Alfred Kinsey published Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, in 1948, followed in 1953 by sexual behavior in the human female, both of which reached the top of the bestseller lists, the church took notice. It was Kinsey's statistics on the behavior of college students, which resulted in a reaction at the Mormon-owned Brigham Young University. In October of 1953, University President Wilkinson, alarmed by the implications of Kinsey's reports, appointed a faculty committee to determine if the school's sex education program was providing a strong enough defense of chastity. At least two faculty committees were appointed to address the masturbation problem. But the next salvo came in 1958, when LDS General Authority Bruce R. McConkie published Mormon Doctrine, which quickly became a very popular reference for many members. The following statement from the book identifies that masturbation results in guilt and shame, and I'm quoting McConkie now, an individual may go to a psychiatrist for treatment because of a serious guilt complex and consequent mental disorder arising out of some form of sex immorality, masturbation, for instance. It's not uncommon for some psychiatrists in such situations to persuade the patient that masturbation itself is not an evil, that his trouble arises from the false teachings of the church, and that therefore, by discarding the teachings of the church, the guilt complex will cease and mental stability will return. In this way, iniquity is condoned and many people are kept from complying with the law whereby they could become clean and spotless before the Lord. 
in the process of which they would gain the mental and spiritual peace that overcomes mental disorders. With this statement, McConkie confidently defined the new Mormon doctrinal policy that mental disorders for masturbation guilt can be overcome by sexual abstinence, while at the same time dogmatically invalidating the scientifically proven therapeutic treatment of the psychiatric profession. In 1969, Apostle Spencer Kimball, later to become the church president and prophet, published additional news statements that further defined and added to the Mormon masturbation policy. While masturbation is not mentioned either in the Bible or Book of Mormon per se, the absence of scriptural authority was irrelevant to Kimball, who said that no one rationalized their sins on the excuse that a particular sin of his is not mentioned nor forbidden in scripture. In addition, he stated his opinion that sexual orientation can be socially changed rather than it being a biological phenomenon. He also said that masturbation often leads to total homosexuality. Done in private, it evolves often into mutual masturbation, practice with another person of the same sex, and hence total homosexuality. Where does he get this practice with another person idea? His book, Miracle of Forgiveness, again, not an official publication of the church, certainly bore the irreproachable authority of apostolic opinion. Like McConkie, he too states that religious authority supersedes and nullifies the empirical research of health professionals. Many would-be authorities declare that it, masturbation, is natural and acceptable. And frequently, young men I interview cite these advocates to justify the practice of it. To this, we must respond that the world's norms in many areas deport increasingly from God's law. The church has a different, higher norm. In the midst of World War II, an official statement by the First Presidency of the Church made during a general conference told youth that they were better off dead than sexually unclean. Undoubtedly, this statement was primarily intended to keep departing servicemen abstinent from sexual intercourse while over there. But it did not distinguish any form of sexual misbehavior. Therefore, it would include masturbation, since masturbation is certainly considered unclean sexual behavior by Mormons. The official LDS church magazine, The Improvement Era, printed the following excerpt from the message of the First Presidency in an article titled, Be Ye Clean. Sexual purity is youth's most precious possession. It's the foundation of all righteousness. Better dead clean than alive unclean. In 1972, the Boy Scout Handbook, was updated to reflect the current health information on masturbation. The updated edition stated, many young men like to masturbate. People used to think this causes weakness, insanity, and other physical or mental problems. Doctors today agree that it doesn't cause any of these, and it's really part of growing up sexually. In perhaps one of the Mormon Church's few recorded conflicts with the Boy Scouts of America, the Church voiced such strong opposition to the revision that 25,000 printed copies that contained that passage were destroyed and the wording was changed to read at the Mormon church's insistence. You may have questions about sexual matters such as nocturnal emissions, also called wet dreams, masturbation, and even those strange feelings that you may have. Talk them over with your parents and or spiritual advisors or doctors. In 1976, an official church pamphlet on masturbation entitled To Young Men Only was distributed to the young men of the church. It was essentially a reprint of an address by Apostle Boyd K. Packer delivered at a priesthood session of the church's general conference. In it, Packer taught youth his own unique homemade theories on sexual desire that differed from those of medical science. He indicated that youth would hardly be aware of sexual desire during puberty if they would just remain constantly abstinent from masturbation. When this power begins to form, it might be likened to having a little factory in your body. Unless you temper it, you will hardly be aware that it's working at all. The above statements clearly show that the Mormon church during that period began teaching that masturbation is a causal factor in sexual desire and in depression. But one example is the case of 16-year-old Kip Eliason, who tried to faithfully follow the church's admonitions regarding total masturbation abstinence. The official church slogan, Better Dead Clean, than alive, unclean, came home to bite the church and set the stage for a dramatic lawsuit against the church and its leadership. In 1982, Eliason followed the church's admonition and committed suicide. Kip believed that he was unworthy to live due to his repeated failure to qualify as a worthy young man during the bishop's interviews. 
In Kip's tragic suicide note, he expresses his feelings of self-loathing and self-hate for failing to live up to the church's standards of total masturbation abstinence. And I'm quoting, Dear Dad, I love you more than words can say. I would stay alive only for you, for I really only have you. But it isn't possible. I first must love myself, and I do not. The strange feelings of darkness and self-hate overpower all my defenses. I must unfortunately yield to them. This turbulent feeling is only for a few to truly understand. I feel that you do not compare, hence the immense feelings of self-hatred I have. This is the only way I feel I can relieve myself off these feelings now. Carry on with your life and be happy. I love you more than words can say, your son, Kip. For suicidal LDS youth struggling with abstinence, could there not be a more endangering message than the Mormon doctrinal slogan, better dead clean than alive unclean? Parenthetically, when I search Ballard on masturbation on Google, it brings up a Mormon porn site. Mark E. Peterson was able to come up with 10 steps to overcome masturbation. Number one, never touch the intimate parts of your body except during normal toilet processes. If your little factory itches, try rubbing yourself against a tree or a park bench. I added that part. Avoid being alone as much as possible and don't associate with other persons having the same problem. Break off those friendships. Remember what Spencer W. Kimball taught. Masturbation leads to mutual masturbation, which le leads to bestiality and finally full-blown homosexuality. Number three, when you bathe, do not admire yourself in the mirror and never stay in the bath more than five or six minutes. Then get out of the bathroom and go into a room where you have other members of your family present. Keep an egg timer in your bathroom, and when it rings, head for the kitchen. Dress first. When in bed, dress yourself for the night. So security that you can't easily touch your vital parts, and so that it would be difficult and time-consuming for you to remove all the those clothes. Wear pajamas that are difficult to open. In severe cases, it may be necessary to tie a hand to the bed frame. If you find it hard to tie yourself to the bed, ask your roommate or your mom for help. Number five, if the temptation seems overwhelming while you're in bed, get out of bed and go into the kitchen and fix yourself a snack. So that's why there's so many fat Mormons. When the temptation to masturbate is strong, yell, stop. Exercise some discretion when in restaurants, on buses, or in crowded theaters. Number seven, consider an effective technique called aversion therapy. The boys down at BYU have done wonders applying electricity to male genitals. During your toiletrine and shower activities, leave the bathroom door or shower curtain partly open to discourage being alone in total privacy. This could also lead to a new relationship with mall security. Number 10, arise immediately in the morning. Don't lie in bed awake. No matter what time of day it is, get up and do something. But make sure that something isn't you know what. I went to Fair Mormon site to view their discussion on the topic of masturbation. And this was the answer that they provided. This is where neurochemistry comes in. Sexual climax involves incredibly powerful chemical events that can be analogous to the effects of powerful drugs. Both make the brain perceive incredible pleasure. Because of neuroplasticity, the brain's tendency to rewire itself so that a stimulus and its response are closely associated with one another, sexual stimulus will be associated with its incredible neurochemical reward. Some of the chemicals that are released during sex are the same as those released after a woman gives birth. And just as those chemicals help a mother to bond with a newborn child, they also help sexual partners to feel bonded to one another. But when sexual stimulus comes in the form of masturbation, completely devoid of the sharing and vulnerability and complementarity of marriage, then the brain can become wired so that it is primarily masturbation that produces the reward. And an individual can become increasingly unaware or unable to sexually respond to their spouse. Masturbation and intercourse are simply different. One who masturbates frequently, a very direct knowledge of what actions bring pleasure most effectively. It can be difficult or impossible for a spouse to reproduce the pleasure that a masturbator has learned how to produce on his or her own. Thus, sexuality, if not expressed in the context of a loving and devout relationship, 
turns inward and becomes a focus on itself. It is spiritually dangerous to use sexuality for self when God intended it to be used to help us overcome our love of self. This statement and the advice contained therein was provided by Steve Densley Jr. Brother Densley graduated with honors nonetheless from Brigham Young University with a combined bachelor and master's degree in public policy and political science. Should young people get their medical advice from a poli-sci major? Well, it could be worse. He could have had a degree in mechanical engineering. Reductio ad absurdum. The fall, this fallacy demonstrates a form of argument in which a proposition is disproven if one follows its implications logically to its absurd conclusion. Arguments that use universals such as always, never, everyone, all, nobody, etc., often provide fertile ground for a proposition being reduced to an absurd conclusion. Example, well, if you want the drinking age lowered to 18, why don't you also let children tend bar? The logical form is we assume the day is true, and from this assumption, we deduce that B is true. Also, we reduce that B is false. Thus, A implies both B and not B, a contradiction, which is necessarily false. Therefore, A itself must be false. Dr. Michael Cole, a renowned non-Mormon scholar, has said, there is not one professionally trained archaeologist who is not a Mormon who sees any scientific justification for believing in the histiosity of the Book of Mormon. When I posed the same question to Fair Mormon, their response to me was, why would a non-Mormon archaeologist, anthropologist, or linguist have any interest in searching for any evidence proving the Book of Mormon? It should be obvious that any Archaeologists, anthropologists, or linguists interested in the subject would themselves be Mormon. This is an example of reductio ad absurdum. As I've said before, by this reasoning, then, it should be obvious that any historian interested in the Third Reich must be a Nazi, and anyone studying serial killers must themselves be one. The Church's contention that there's no death before the fall is another example of reductio ad absurdum. There's overwhelming archaeological evidence of death having occurred on Earth for many millions of years. For example, oil deposits are formed from the decomposition of ancient plants and animals. This is where church teachings appear to contradict science. Latter-day Saint Revelation teaches that there is no death on Earth of any forms of life before the fall of Adam. Indeed, death entered the world as a direct result of the fall. And that's from 2 Nephi 2.22 and Moses 6.48. This interpretation has been shared by many church authors, including President Joseph Fielding Smith and Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Consequently, the concept of no death before the fall on the entire earth has made its way into many church and structural manuals and the LDS edition of the King James Bible in 1979. Here's another gem from Boyd K. Packer. It is also to the Book of Mormon to which we turn for the plainest description of the Catholic Church as the great and abominable church. Nephi saw this church, which was the most abominable above all other churches in vision. He saw the devil, that he was the foundation of it, and also the murders, wealth, harlotry, persecutions, and evil desires that historically have been a part of this satanic organization. And another particularly nasty one coming from Brigham Young. Shall I tell you the law of God with regard to the African race? If the white man mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. And another Mormon racist, George Fielding Smith, wrote, Not only was Cain called upon to suffer, but because of his wickedness, he became the father of an inferior race. But I think the following statement by Board K. Packer has to be the all-time winner, showing the character and mean-spirit ignorance of so many of these arrogant men who call themselves apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a hard time with historians because they idolize the truth. The truth is not uplifting. It destroys. I could tell most of the secretaries in this church office building that they were ugly and fat. That would be the truth, but it would hurt and destroy them. How kind of you, Boyd. Another example of a reductio ad absurdum. Anyone in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment must be in favor of killing babies. Wanting to go to an after-grad party, the daughter says, all my friends are going, to which her father responds, 
Well, if all your friends were going to jump off a bridge, would you do that too? Son to mother. The sign says we shouldn't pick the flowers, but if I pick just one, it won't hurt. Mother, if everyone was to take that attitude, then there'd be no flowers left for any of us. The fallacy of the beard, the fallacy of assuming that the existence of a continuum of possible states between two binary positions means that the said positions are not really different. It's a form of equivocation, treating the equivalent of two things that should not be treated as equivalent. The alternative name is the fallacy of gray, and it comes from an invalid inference from a good premise. The sound premise represents the argument that some complex real world decisions or events are neither black nor white, but gray. This is true under many circumstances. <clears throat> the invalid inference is to infer that since there are so many shades of gray, one cannot identify a dividing point between the two binary positions. When applied to the realm of expertise, this fallacy is something known as the inflation of conflict. Inflation of conflict occurs when someone claims that because two or more experts disagree on one point, no conclusion can be drawn and the entire field or area of, of research is probably discredited to boot. The name comes from the heat paradox in philosophy, using a man's beard for an example. At what point does a man go from clean shaven to having a beard? If you have one hair on your face, do you have a beard? No. How about 100? How about 110? How about 111, etc.? The logical form is X is one extreme, Y is another extreme. There is no definable point between X and Y. Therefore, there is no difference between X and Y. An example, Jim, I'll never go bald. Alice, why is that? Jim, well, if I lose just one hair, will I be bald? Alice, of course not. Jim, how about two hairs? Alice, no. Jim, ergo, every time I lose a hair, the loss of that one hair will not make me bald. Therefore, I'll never go bald. Alice, super. I guess you've just discovered the cure for baldness. Stupidity. Here's another example. Why does the law state that you have to be 21 years old to drink? Does it really make any difference if you're 20 years and 364 days old? That's absurd. Therefore, if a single day makes no difference, then a collection of 1,095 single days wouldn't make any difference. Therefore, changing the drinking age to 18 doesn't make any difference. Although this does appear to be typical 18-year-old thinking, it's quite a common fallacy. Just because any single step makes no apparent difference, there is a difference, and sometimes more noticeable as the number of steps increase. Richard Dawkins, one of the world's best known and most outspoken atheists, recently provoked outrage among child protection agencies and experts after suggesting that recent child abuse scandals had been overblown. In an interview in the Times magazine, Dawkins said he was unable to condemn what he called the mild pedophilia he experienced at an English school when he was a child in the 1950s. He recalled how one of his masters pulled me on his knee and put his hand inside my shorts. He also said that other children in the school had likewise been molested by the same teacher, but concluded, I don't think he did any of us any lasting harm. He also said, I'm very conscious that you can't condemn people of an earlier era by the standards of ours, just as we don't look back on the 18th and 19th centuries and condemn people for racism in the same way as we would condemn modern persons of racism. I look back to a few decades to my childhood and I see things like caning, mild pedophilia, and can't find it in me to condemn it by the same standards as I or anyone would today. He said that the most notorious cases of pedophilia involving rape or even murder, should not be bracketed with what he called just mild touching up. Well, when does just mild touching up become pedophilia? If he does it more than once, if he or she does it to several children, if there's oral sex involved, Dawkins maintains that there's no definitive line. I would argue that while we don't always know right from wrong, that doesn't mean that there isn't right from wrong. As more and more Mormons are discovering, Joseph Smith married several teenage girls at least one as young as 14. When he was in his very late 30s, the church apologists, of course, screamed presentism and come out with articles like the following written by Gail Boyd 
entitled Mormon Polygamy Joseph Smith's Teenage Bride, which appeared on LDSnet. She writes, Helen Mar Kimball became the plural wife of Mormon prophet Joseph Smith a few months shy of her 15th birthday. While taking a bride so young startles us in this day and age, it was not uncommon in the early 19th century. Plural marriage was practiced in about 85% of the world, but the idea was repugnant among European and American Christians. A few months shy of her 15th birthday, what bizarre phrasing. And President Nelson is a few years shy of being dead. The church apologists like to say that it was not altogether uncommon for girls as young as 14 to marry. They fail to mention that a girl of this tender age marrying a man approaching 40 is extremely uncommon, even back then. As I show in my letter to an apologist using census data I gathered from Illinois and New York in the 1840s, Smith's marriage, if we could call it that, to Helen Kimball was almost certainly the only 14, 37-year-old cohort in those two states for that entire year. It seems to me that the church is reaching for the fallacy of the beard when it repeatedly refers to Helen as being a few months shy of 15. The argument from incredulity is concluding that because you can't believe something or refuse to, it must not be true. And the argument flawed, it's related to the argument from ignorance fallacy. The logical form is person one makes a claim, person two cannot believe the claim, person two concludes without any reason other than he or she cannot believe it or, or refutes it, that the claim is false or highly improbable. Example, Carl Sagan. Yes, we really did successfully land people on the moon. Tinfoil hat guy. Yeah, right. And I suppose you also believe that Elvis is dead. Doc, I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that you invented. Now, I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Tell him the truth, Doc. You got to believe me. Then tell me, future boy. <laughs> Who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan? The actor? <laughs> then who's vice president? Jerry Lewis. You gotta listen to me. I got enough practical jokes for one evening. Good night, future boy. Clearly, Marty is making an extraordinary claim. And the doc's dismissal of Marty's claim is based on pure incredulity. It isn't until Marty provides Doc with extraordinary evidence how he came up with the flux capacitor that Doc accepts that Marty's claim might be correct. Given the nature of Marty's claim, it would be argued that Doc's dismissal of Marty's claim, altogether technically fallacious, was the more reasonable thing to do than entertain its possibility under the circumstances. Someone using the argument from incredulity might claim that since they don't see how a certain scientific theory could possibly be true, it must therefore be false. People often use the argument from incredulity in an attempt to discredit valid theories that they disagree with or to support some unfounded pseudoscientific theory or religious belief. So it's important that we understand this fallacy. The argument from incredulity is a common apologetic tactic used by those favoring intelligent design. There's a number of variations on this theme. A popular one is the use of the typewriting monkeys. Here, the apologist suggests that believing that the universe has come to be by chance is analogous to believing that if you had an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters over an infinite period of time, they would be able to come up with the completed works of Shakespeare. There are various versions of this, but the original came from a British physicist named Frederick Hoyle. In fact, there's a logical fallacy that bears his name. According to Frederick Hoyle, the probability of cellular life arising from non-living matter, a biogenesis, was about 1 in 10 to the 40,000th power. That's 1 with 40,000 zeros after it. He commented, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble at Boeing 747 from the materials therein. President Russell Nelson uses another common example. Some people erroneously think that these marvelous physical attributes happened by chance or resulted from a big bang somewhere. <laughs> Ask yourself. 
Could an explosion in a printing shop produce a dictionary? <laughs> the likelihood is most remote. But if so, it could never heal its own torn pages or reprodu reproduce its own newer editions. Could an explosion in a printing shop produce a dictionary? The likelihood is most remote. But if so, it could never heal its own torn pages or reproduce its own newer editions. I interpret Nelson as saying that the odds of the universe coming into being through a big bang somewhere, and by implication that advanced life forms occurred through evolution are simply too great, therefore God. The obvious problem with his similitude is that it limits the being of our universe and the breadth of evolution to the interval of a single event or explosion. Astrophysicists, astronomers, and cosmologists tell us that a titanic explosion, which they've dubbed the Big Bang, occurred 13.8 billion years ago. Evolutionary biologists who have studied the origins of life on this planet since the time of Jean-Baptiste Lamar and Charles Darwin suggest that life began on this planet between 3.5 and 4 billion years ago. I feel that anecdotes such as President Nelson's explosion in a print shop is not helpful, as it's based on faulty assumptions, assumptions that can be too easily refuted. Nelson's cute little anecdote, and he wasn't the creator of it, got him a couple of laughs, but it's not a very thoughtful analogy, a more serious and sophisticated argument favoring intelligent design might go something like this. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist. The universe began, scientists believe, with the sum of all energy jammed into a very tiny point, exploding with mind-boggling force, creating matter and propelling it outward to make the billions of galaxies of our universe However, they're at a loss when it comes to explaining what caused this singularity. Likewise, there is compelling and some would say overwhelming evidence that favors natural selection as a mechanism for adaptability and improved survivability. I personally feel that transition of life as a result of evolution is not just plausible, but likely. However, science has failed to provide us with anything showing how relatively simple early forms of life arose from non-living matter. This is called abiogenesis, and like the source of the Big Bang, leaves nothing but questions. So there's still room for God. I personally believe that there was a creator responsible for both the Big Bang, as well as imbuing the spark of life into the combination of enzymes and proteins and amino acids that formed the first elementary form of life. Nelson's print shop illustration suggests random action, but the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe and evolution was and is anything but random. The main tenant of evolution, for example, is natural selection, which is far from random. Traits that are beneficial for survival and reproduction or propagation are selected by evolution. Traits that increase survival odds are more likely to continue, for example, in a world where carnivores are endangered, traits such as longer legs or a better respiratory system or higher intelligence will give the species who fall prey to these beasts an increased chance of survival. Those organisms that have these mutations that improve those traits have an advantage over those that do not. Simply stated, those without those traits become dinner, but those with those traits survive and they breed and over time those traits become magnified, and as a whole the species gets smarter, longer lay, with better respiratory systems. Nelson's example limits the scope of creation and evolution to the time span of a single explosion. 
The oldest known fossils on Earth are approximately 4.5 billion years old, but some scientists have discovered chemical evidence suggesting that life may have begun even earlier, perhaps 4 billion years ago. So evolution on this planet has had a very long time in which to operate. Although mutations are found in every type of organism, the process of natural selection is very slow, but it can be speeded up as even the most strident creationists must concede by selective breeding. Evidence of selective breeding of dogs over a few hundred years or the propagation of new plants to better serve man's needs, frost-resistant wheat, sweeter apples, or seedless grapes, for example. The American Kennel Club recognizes 195 breeds of dog, with 79 additional breeds working towards full recognition says Gina DiNardo, Executive Secretary of the American Kennel Club. Remember, too, that when you hear a Mormon or other fundamentalist mock evolution as a fantastically unlikely long shot, you must time those odds by the number of times possible interactions could occur. If one rolls a single dice, the chances of it coming up six are one in six. However, while the odds are slim, one might throw it 20 times and never have it come up six. But if one throws the dice once per second, 24 hours a day for a full month, statistically the odds of the six coming up very, very close to one in six is almost certain. The chances of X happening are one in Y. Therefore, providing Y does not equal infinity, X is possible. If the number of occasions equals infinity, no matter how improbable X is, providing it's not impossible, it will eventually occur. Moreover, given an infinite number of chances, infinity divided by Y gives a 100% chance of X as well. Before calculating odds of a future event occurring, it has to be possible. Do the laws of physics allow, as in President Nelson's example, for the assembly of type into rows by wind pressure alone. As well, one has to know what the factors are in determining the odds. If I ask you what the odds are of rolling a dice without first telling you how many sides the dice has, you have no possible answer other than to say somewhere between one and infinity. A second argument might be that President Nelson's ideologically driven interpretation, which assumes that the universe arose with the goal of supporting life rather than life arising as a result of conditions in the universe being amenable to it. I don't necessarily disagree with Nelson's conclusion that God was responsible for the creation of the universe and indeed ourselves. Rather, my concern is with the non-critical thinking leading him to that conclusion. As critical thinkers, we must avoid falling victim to this type of end justifying the means lazy thinking. Logic matters. Further, given the multiverse theory, there could be an infinite number of universes that might support life and an infinite number that might not. To put it another way, there could be an infinite number that have the fine-tuning for life and an infinite number that do not. We just happen to be on one that does. A second argument that could be made by a critic is that President Nelson's ideologically driven interpretation assumes that the universe arose with the goal of supporting life, rather than life arising as a result of the conditions of the universe being amenable to it. Further, those who accept the multiverse theory would suggest that there could be an infinite number of universes uh, that might support life and an infinite number that might not. To put it another way, there could be an infinite number that have the fine-tuning for life and an infinite number that do not. We just happen to be on one that does. So in short, while I do not disagree with Nelson's conclusion that God was responsible for the creation of the universe and indeed ourselves, my issue is with the simplistic, non-critical thinking leading him to that conclusion. As critical thinkers, we must avoid falling victim to this type of end justifying the means type of lazy thinking. Logic also matters. I've learned much from brilliant scientists such as Francis Collins and John Lennox, men of faith 
who provide great insight into how the Big Bang singularity, as well as the principles of evolution, are not inconsistent with intelligent design, and I'd commend those thinkers to you. The logical flaw here is that President Nelson is overlaying the straw man and the appeal to ignorance fallacies onto the creation of life question and the efficacy of evolution, concluding that life on Earth must be a result of intelligent design. His reasoning could be expressed this way. Organic life requires 4,000 enzymes, which is true. It's impossible for 4,000 enzymes to form by random chance. This is a straw man, random chance. Therefore, life on Earth was created by God. This is the appeal to ignorance. Granted, Russell Nelson is not an intellectual, but presumably he is, or at least was, a man of science. Perhaps he's hoping that the explosion in the print shop analogy will be vivid enough to distract his listeners from thinking more deeply about the efficacy of the theory of evolution and the creation of the universe question. He is overlaying straw man and appeal to ignorance fallacies onto the creation of life question, concluding that life on Earth must be a result of intelligent design. His conclusion may be correct, but his reasoning certainly is not. President Nelson's a priori argument would be clearly rejected by the vast majority of biologists from an evolutionary standpoint. Every serious biological science, even I would hazard a guess, those at BYU, would proffer that other mechanisms formed as precursors prior to organic life becoming self-replicating and resulting in the incredible diversity of life we witness on our planet today. The process that underlies biology in general and human life specifically are much more complex than the most difficult and perplexing challenges in chemistry or physics that we see today. While the odds of a sudden construction of higher life forms are unquestionably remote and improbable, remember that evolution proceeds in many smaller changes, each driven by natural selection rather than by serendipity and over a very, very long period of time. Resorting to logical fallacies, whether deliberately or unwittingly, is not a good way to investigate the natural world. The floating of such a superficial analogy by someone intelligent enough to understand the flaws that I've just described and discussed is regrettable. Brother Nelson and the church can do better.